now at the end of Marx's Capital, and I'd like to give two lectures on Marx's politics. I'll try to keep them about an hour each at the most. Uh, the first one will be an overview of um, the link between Marx's theory of capital as a social and economic system and his theory of politics. And I'll be talking a lot about not just Marxist politics, but, but Marxist politics, in other words, the political analysis of those who follow in Marx's tradition. Um, and I'll be using a particular uh, material from um, the Oxford Handbook of Karl Marx that I've been reading uh, uh, in the, quite a bit lately in this unit, uh, edited by Matt Vidal, Tony Smith, uh, Thomas Rota, and Paul Pru. a really good volume. Uh, excellent articles in there about all sides of, of, uh, of Marx's work. So, um, so again, a lot of what I'm talking about today um, can, was gleaned from uh, reading that book as well as some other sources. But Okay, so... Um, so today we'll do the overview, in this lecture we'll do the overview of Marx's politics, and then in the following lecture we'll walk carefully through the Communist Manifesto, the 18th Brumaire, and, uh, and the Civil War in France, with probably a little bit of, of discussion of the critique of the Goethe program. So we get some sense of how Marx criticizes other people's versions of communism. Okay, so, um, all right, so just to get us back into this, so Marx... In, in, in our last lecture, we sort of ended with Marx's analysis of the historical trajectory of capitalist accumulation and his clear understanding that capital is doomed to eventual collapse. Capital is not a universal system. Um, it's not society or nature's last word on the way to organize an economy. It is a historically contingent system. And there will be an after capital. It will not last forever. And so much of his work was to theorize uh, the contradictions built into the capitalist system and in an attempt to comprehend what the limit would be. Where will capital fail and, and what will after capital look like? Um, Marx's politics is a focused upon uh, the working class, the labor as the revolutionary subject, and in fact, the subject of post-capitalism. So the, the interest uh, group, the people who will be um, leading us through a revolution and into a post-capitalist society, at least one worth living in, according to Marx, will be the, uh, will be the, the, the proletariat of the working class. So Marx's politics really is all about that, all about uh, the proletariat as a class. How does it function? What is, um, how do we build class consciousness? Um, how do you develop agency, um, uh, especially organizational structures that enable uh, the working class to realize its political interests? Uh, what do you do in the face of capitalist opposition uh, to working class interests and so on? So Marx's politics, um, again, fundamentally down to the ground are, are rooted in an analysis of capitalism as a passing social system uh, that is crisis prone and that will eventually collapse. So he always has in mind the next system, what will be next, and then the um, analysis of the, of, of the proletariat as the revolutionary group that will lead us out of uh, the, the, uh, the communist system into something hopefully better. So, so that's Marx. Um, okay, so again, so to Marx, the end of capital is inevitable. It, it, ca capital is going to collapse on its own, internally. It won't require a revolutionary force. It's going to collapse. But revolution will almost certainly be necessary in order to ensure that capitalism um, is um, followed by, um, by a worker um, socialist society instead of some other uh, uh, social form, okay? So if there is to be a post-capitalism worth living in, then the working class needs to organize and, and become a political uh, 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 power in, um, in our time. So, uh, so revolutionary, revolution is going to happen, and it's going to be, it, it, and, and uh, he looked at the Paris Commune of 1870 as a model of sort of how that organization uh, can structure. Okay, so, um, so again, eventually the contradictions of capital are going to increase and become increasingly difficult to manage or contain, 
right? And increasing resources are going to be spent to try to uh, keep the working class uh, sort of installed in the absorption system. And, uh, and there's going to be increasing attention and effort uh, deployed by capital to continue to negate contradictions. So um, I've been influenced for years by uh, Michelle Aglietta's uh, theory of capitalist regulation. This uh, work uh, and, and all of the, 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 the work that follows in this tradition emphasizes how capitalism will collapse and does collapse in crisis moments and that it is only kept valid or uh, functioning through, uh, through state intervention and state apparatus. And what Aglietta argues, as well as many other people, is that um, capitalism is sort of a history of these regulatory regimes or regimes of accumulation. Some state structure that finds a way to balance the contradictions between you know, the, uh, the, the socialization of labor and the uh, 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 you know, uh, privatization of capital. And uh, so, so politics is always already implicated in capitalist functioning. And we've been in a neoliberal regime of accumulation for probably 35, 40 years now. And we're probably moving into something different. I would, um, we'll, we'll probably use the term that's, 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 that's gaining currency in a critical uh, social theory. Um, authoritarian capitalism is probably the new regime that seems to be emerging. So politics and power and the state are always already involved in capital. And so it, we as working people or working people generally um, are already involved in, 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 in a political structure. And so the problem of Marxist politics then is how to help the political, um, how to help the proletariat organize politically and be an effective force. So um, Eric Olin Wright, um, you know, uh, writes about the high road and the low road um, in capitalism, that um, the high road being a, um, a regulatory regime that tends to support workers, lifts them up, and enhances democratic uh, society and democratic action, which would lead us to a positive sort of utopian, um, a democratic, egalitarian post-capitalism. That's the high road uh, regulatory regime that's really affiliated with, um, you know, like the, the, the um, Scandinavian uh, uh, countries, you know, the Nordic uh, versions of capitalism. And he contrasts that to the low road uh, uh, that capitalism, uh, the low road of capital regulation in which, um, you know, workers are undermined, capital is empowered, exploitation increases, um, worker freedom tends to vanish. This is, and, and this would tend to lead us down a negative road, a low road uh, to a post-capitalist future. So it's the difference between sort of lifting up a social democracy, welfare uh, systems, wars on poverty, and so on, that would be the high road, versus this kind of neoliberalism cut to welfare systems, um, tax structures, um, social insurance schemes, and so on, and, and really sort of leaving uh, the working class vulnerable to almost unlimited um, exploitation en route to, again, a, a, the ultimate collapse of capital. So you can either lift up or control down the high road or the low road, um, in, and in either case, capital is already a political system, a political regime. Okay. All right. So let's look at a couple of images before we get started then. Uh, so last time we talked about, um, uh, about primitive accumulation, that prior to capital accumulation feasting on living labor, there is a movement to incorporate non-living labor, uh, excuse me, uh, labor and life outside of capital into it through imperialism and warfare and genocide and other things. So this is a 19th century woodcut, uh, or excuse me, or illustration, London going out of town, the march of bricks and mortar. Just this wonderful image of London, the capital of capital in the 19th century, um, you know, extending itself elsewhere, right? The logic of capital uh, going um, outside. I love these little uh, automaton uh, workers that are located in here. I love the little fleeing of the uh, of sort of the peasant haystacks or something. Okay, so as capital grows and spreads and conquers the globe, it disrupts and um, transforms peasants, uh, lower middle class people, um, um, tribal people, um, forest people, into industrial workers. Right, so that the world winds up filled 
with people who are working as proletariat, uh, having their labor absorbed by capital, right? So we wind up with a world of proletariats, right? Of proletarian, of, of working class people. So Marx is interested in developing working class politics um, whereby the proletariat develops a consciousness of itself, uh, develops an ability to comprehend the actual laws of capital and to intervene in the system on its own behalf and ultimately lead into a less exploitative post-capitalist system. So, so working class politics is ultimately what Marx is aiming at, right? A politics of workers as workers bonding together as workers in um, opposition to capital as capital. So, and, you know, in the same way that Marx believes that the, um, that the entire economic system, right, is, is being transformed into a, a capitalist system with proletariat, so too must politics. So this is an image of paupers in Britain um, uh, during the um, 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 heavy industrialization of the mid-19th century. You know, Marx wrote about Ireland. This is the Irish famine um, seen at the gate of a workhouse. You know, uh, Irish people and people throughout um, Europe and elsewhere who were faced with capitalism's onslaught, um, you, you know, they were displaced from their peasant dwellings, from the land that they occupied, from their surf uh, uh, conditions, and they wound up in, in urban areas. And if capital was unable to absorb their labor in a workstation somewhere, right, if they were excess, if this is the Industrial Reserve Army, uh, something had to happen to them, right, to the bodies. And so workhouses were created um, in order to um, essentially imprison and, 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 um, and, and force work out of those who, um, who found their ways in, in, into cities. So this is working class children in one of these workhouses. Here's labor inside of one of the workhouses, actually like breaking rocks up. Um, so you're not paid wage labor. You're just given the right to stay in the workhouse in exchange for working all day long at some sort of low efficiency activity here. Remember when we talked last time about the end of capital under absolute surplus value extraction or the other, um, even the end of capital under relative surplus value extraction, if you're going to wind up with a lot of unemployed people or really, really, really low efficiency uh, workstations where people are just sort of installed and made to work all day long. Here's an image of people uh, sleeping in one of these facilities, right? Um, so working in what is essentially a jail or a prison or a concentration camp as a, as a housing structure. So what's important about these images, the reason I'm showing them now, is that Marx argues that whatever happens to the working class has to, so that the working class has to not just be about itself, right? Not just about, the working class has to just have to be the political agency of its own emancipation, but that it needs to become kind of like a universal subject of post-capital. That means that the working class has to recognize how poor people who aren't currently working in the system, but are nevertheless waiting in the ring, wings as the Industrial Reserve Army, are both part of capital's accumulation and part of the political situation of working people. And therefore, um, Marxist politics has to incorporate, again, not just an organization and emancipation of the working class, but of all people um, uh, within the system, including those who are paupers or um, lumpen proletariats or, um, you know, human scum. Uh, you know, again, there's different terms that Marx uses uh, to reference these people um, at times. So, all right. So let's jump in then. So what, um, so Marx then is, um, try to get this a little closer for you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so Marx's politics then is intertwined and informed by his theory of capitalism. So capitalism is uh, crisis prone. Remember that? So, 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 okay. So point number one, capitalism is crisis prone. It won't last forever. Therefore, the post capitalist horizon needs to be kept in mind in Marx's politics. In other words, working class people need to organize, not just to realize a good life in capital or to resist exploitation in capital, but they actually need to be organized uh, to enhance the post-capitalist world or to be a leader in the post-capitalist world or to lead us into the post-capitalist world. 
In other words, they have to have a revolutionary consciousness. So capitalism is crisis prone, doomed to collapse. Politics, therefore, must include and focus upon after capitalism. What will post capitalism uh, look like? That kind of imagination is crucial uh, to, uh, to Marx's politics. So politics should always include the horizon of post capital. All right, so what does that mean? Um, so there's two basic imaginations or imaginaries that can dominate in um, um, contemporary politics. There's the Marxist um, imaginary, which tends to be utopian, okay? So Marx ultimately has a very positive view of post-capitalist society, right? So, um, so, um, so when you imagine the future, what the future could look like, uh, Marxism tends to have a pretty sanguine, positive view of the future, rooted in the concept of the general intellect, um, which refers to the system that results from relative surplus value extraction whereby you wind up with a massive system of machinery and robotics and technological innovations that produce useful things for human beings with relatively little time. This means that the future post-capital will be a world of relative abundance and that workers won't be doing like 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 physical labor so much as they will be engaged in, in again what Marx calls the general intellect or feeding or growing the general intellect to be involved in the creative process of of designing better machines designing better products and so on so it'd be kind of creative work so it's a positive view of work in the future one where work and play are more united than they are in capital You'll have a democratic society where the members of society themselves, the working people themselves, will be deciding upon uh, the shape of politics and the direction of, of production and other matters. And the realm of freedom will expand. In other words, necessary labor will be reduced to a minimum. And the rest of our time then will be relatively free to explore creativity and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, social life. So, so it's a positive view of the future. So capitalism is playing a world historical role, um, exploitative as can be, but that the labor of working people right now is being embedded as dead labor in a massive production system, robotic, automated, and so on. Um, in, in, in a piece that I wrote with Mark Worrell, we refer to this as Big Mama, <laughs> that the future involves the creation of a kind of, of society as Big Mama, where um, um, you know, we're nurturing, uh, meeting people's needs, um, uh, providing succor or comfort, um, you know, uh, providing, you know, supporting people uh, in their freely chosen activities becomes uh, the central role of society and government and so on. So post-capitalism will be this rather pleasant world where, um, you know, where the general intellect will, will create this robotic system humming along in the background, allowing us to, um, to live in more freedom than we've ever no. Now that world is written about in, um, in, you know, in a lot of Marxist literature. My favorite is um, uh, Massimo De Angelis's uh, The Beginning of History, Values, Struggles, and Global Capital. It's a book really about Marxist politics and about um, really with just the notion that, that we right now are creating something like the um, post-capitalist world and that the realm of freedom will expand greatly the day after capitalism ends and that history will begin at that moment that up till now we've been in the prehistory where we remain enslaved to capital itself and that once freed from that human potential will be unleashed in ways that are very difficult for us to to know and predict so so the marxist imaginary tends to be very positive a utopian imaginary um, reactionary politics, so those who confront Marxism, tend to have a rather dystopian imaginary of the future, um, in, one in which anarchy always reigns where there are invasion forces coming in, aliens are going to come and take us over. Um, we need an authoritarian state to confront rising authoritarianism elsewhere. Fascism is always waiting in the rings, a police state. Um, we need to keep uh, something like a new version of slavery around to manage the massive hordes who are displaced by robotics and so on. Um, 
you know, techno fascism is a term that's gained a lot of currency right now. And sort of like an apocalyptic collapse is, is, is on the verge of occurring. And that if we ever did away with capital, that we'd have just this unleashing of lawlessness and so on. So law and order, to use the words of Donald Trump, are necessary now to keep the working class in check and to keep uh, the forces of, 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 uh, of revolution and change in check, right? So if we don't do this, build a world of authoritarianism and fascism and so on, uh, we're going to have a dystopian uh, a future. So, so um, this is, instead of a big mama future, this is a big daddy future, or instead of a world in which big mama is augmented, uh, again, comfort care, um, and nurturing, and so on, we instead have control, uh, policing, uh, uh, punishment, um, uh, discipline, and that kind of stuff is the major logic of our time. Remember that, that progressives, or, uh, and Marx is sort of the ultimate progressive, tend to view, so this is time on that dimension, they tend to view that the world is going to get better the more it evolves, that's a basic progressive worldview, and that uh, conservatives tend to have a declension view that the world is getting worse over time, right? The good old days, the bad future that must be resisted through, you know, again, uh, you know, putting down the boot and the law. Okay. So Marxist politics then tends to be revolutionary, but it's revolutionary, revolutionary in a way that is difficult for us in the West to comprehend. It's a positive revolution. It's a revolution that aims at the maximization of human flourishing. Western capitalist ideology tends to view that revolution as something very bloody and very dark and destructive and so on. But to Marx, it's, it's, it's really an unleashing of human potential by freeing workers from the quasi-slave owner of capital, right? Okay, so, so, so revolutionary um, and, and, and utopian, right, as the two things. Okay, and then number two. So that's number one. So Marx's politics always has that revolutionary and utopian quality to it. Number two, class is the determinant of identity. The political subject in our time must be a class subject. So what does that mean? That means that that um, Marxian politics is rooted in proletarian and working class interests and the recognition that the industrial working class, the corporate wage uh, a labor is the historical subject that's going to lead us from capitalism into post-capitalism, right? So Marxian politics is all about providing political potency to working people right? Working people as working people, right? Okay, so why would that be the case? Well, number one, working people are becoming the numerical majority within, uh, within capitalism, right? That is, capitalism progresses and uh, that the world gets reduced, according to Marx, down to either a proletariat or a bourgeoisie. Clearly, the proletariat outnumbers the bourgeoisie, so the, the wage labor worker is going to be the numerical majority. And even if that doesn't quite happen, they clearly right? Wage laborers in the capital system are the source of all value and hence the source of all social and political power and therefore are wielding immense potential uh, for, uh, for political revolution and reconstruction, right? Capital cannot live without workers. Workers can live without capital. So the day that workers realize that and engage in revolutionary activity, capital ends and we move into something else, all right? This is Marx. Right, so there's a belief then that if working class people would unite, right, and pursue uh, their own political and economic interests, capital would be transformed uh, through revolution or even evolution, and like in the Fabians and, and uh, uh, Edward Bernstein, you know, this idea that po political parties could get us to a post-capitalist world. But whether it's revolutionary action or evolutionary politics, if the working class could ever get their quote-unquote shit together, and act as a um, as a united force, um, you could you, we, we would move into post ca uh, capitalism rather quickly. So something like communism or socialism, not as imagined and invoked by the political right, but communism or socialism as an egalitarian world of democratic action, uh, coupled with the realm of freedom, uh, where work is kept to an, uh, a minimum and people are free to explore creativity in ways again that we cannot quite imagine yet. So Marx's politics then is radically democratic, always uh, about developing the proletariat into a class for itself, right? A class that's awake, a class that's intelli intelligently aware of the structure and logic of capital, and therefore is capable of reality testing um, and management 
of uh, not only the political moment, but managing a revolution when the revolutionary moment arises and then managing post-capitalism, right? So what I like about Marx, it's scientific socialism in the words of, of, uh, of Frederick Engels, it's scientific. That means that, that to Marx, he's not trying to develop an ideology. He's not trying to develop pure propaganda. This is actual social science, right? And that what he, what the book Capital and what Marx is attempting to do is to literally enlighten workers into the actual ontological structure of capital, into the way that capital operates, into its real structure. This isn't about a story, about a fantasy, about a fiction, or to use the phrase from right-wing propaganda, a narrative. This isn't a narrative. This is a scientifically um, um, explored, um, uh, s disciplined with scholarship, um, um, adequate, accurate, apt view of the world, right? Again, capital will fail. Capital is about the exploitation of living labor. And uh, capital can't exist without living labor, but living labor could without capital. So, so the, th this is sort of the essence of Marxist politics, is actually raising the consciousness of workers and placing them in a position to be revolutionary subjects and the, uh, you know, the controllers of the post-capitalist uh, system. Okay, so Marx's life work then, uh, the book Capital itself, uh, as well as all of his other uh, uh, writings, is about comprehending the essential structure and dynamics of capital and then communicating that to the working class uh, to inform their political action, right? So he's not trying to make these duped subjects of politics. That's not Marxist uh, scholarship or Marxist uh, politics at all. You're not trying to dupe people or, or um, emote people into political action. You're trying to educate them into it, right? So it's, it really is about enlightenment uh, reality testing, um, uh, discipline, uh, uh, disciplined thinking, um, you know, comprehending uncomfortable facts, um, recognizing difficulties. You know, as Marx says, you know, constantly starting again, tearing down your own ideas and your own theory and, and, and incorporating mistakes and trying to do it again. In other words, truly being a scholar of, of, um, of the society in which you live and then trying to intervene in it in a way that minimizes negative effects and so on, right? So, so part of Marx's effort then is to identify the barriers to revolutionary politics and, uh, dev and then to devise stratagems to negate uh, the things that are blocking um, you know, working class action. So building an organizational, uh, and then also building an organizational base for working class politics comprehending arenas and agents for revolutionary struggle and then theorizing the outcomes of post-capitalism and giving a kind of navigational heading, you know, like a compass on a sailboat or something like that, that guides uh, revolutionary actors so that they know what to do, where to, aim, where, where to arrive and what to do when they get there. Okay. All right. So to summarize then, Marxist politics is always revolutionary. Uh, post-capitalism is in view. Uh, two, class is the, um, is the core identity of the political actor. Solidarity and class consciousness is essential for, uh, for politics, effective politics, and it's essentially working class or labor identity, right? And, that, and there are three basic agents or organs of working class politics. There's unions, and then like the union of unions, like Marx's International Working Man's Association, this, this massive sort of... Um, network and, you know, again, union of unions that could um, raise working class struggle above sort of shop floor disputes with management into broader political coalitions that could lead to fundamental um, uh, uh, political change. So number one is unions. Number two is the labor socialist and, and, uh, and communist uh, parties. And uh, Right, political. So, so you have unions, shop floor. You have political parties uh, working the political angle, and then um, mass spontaneous action, strikes, the general strike, demonstrations, and so on. You know, again, direct action. Those are the three um, agents um, that can lead to um, political change. Um, so, let's look then very briefly at Marx's class analysis. So, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat are the two essential classes. In, uh, in Marx, right, and in, in our time, so, but they're not the only ones. And so Marx is writing in, you know, the beginning of the middle of the 19th century, you know, 1840s, ending in like the 1870s. 
So this is a time yet when we still had an aristocratic uh, uh, pre-capitalist elite. They were very important at the beginning of Marx's period, less important later. So they kind of wash out of the system, although they're important early on. Yeah, the bourgeoisie then that remains is sort of the upper class. Um, you know, capital's personification. You then have these other social groups, these other classes that are not industrial proletariat. The most important of which, the numerically dominant group in society, in the middle 19th century society, are peasants or small holding agrarian producers. And I'm sorry I wrote all over this bloody thing. Sorry about that. But, but small holding agrarian producers, you know, small, American small farmers. Um, in the 19th century, this was the numerically dominant group. 80, 90 percent of European populations were agrarian workers. Um, as recently as 1900, half of Americans were agrarian uh, smallholders and agrarian workers, right? So these are not urban industrial proletariat. These are people who own a little piece of property or who work for those who own a little piece of property and who are embedded in a system that is only tangentially connected uh, to capital. So they are a version, a variant of petty bourgeois, even though they have a slightly different uh, focus. They're the numerically dominant rural, traditional uh, petty bourgeois. Okay, And Marx is going to say that this group tends to be decisive in the 19th century for preventing proletarian re revolution. So the peasants wind up getting hooked up with an aristocracy like they did in, um, uh, you know, the... the um, uh, uh, the coup d'etat of uh, Napoleon III, um, you know, we know uh, Bonaparte's seizure of France in 1851. It was really the peasants were a decisive group along with the petty bourgeois. Who are the petty bourgeois? Small capitalists, small business people, tradespeople, craftspeople, merchants, people who live off the capitalist system, you know, filling out the pores of the system, uh, living off the crumbs of the system, and so on. Um, in my judgment, it also includes the rising salaried managers, the professionals, um, uh, commission salespeople, and all these technicians in the system, you know, accountants and lawyers and so on, who own uh, a kind of advanced specialized skill, often degreed or certified, that gives them something like a little piece of property, right? Like a PhD gives you a little piece of property. Uh, a law degree is like a little piece of property that you own and can, and can farm. Uh, for your own benefit. And that puts you in a different set uh, um, stance towards capital than wage earners. So even though technically you're still working with only your body, um, you're identifying more with uh, the bourgeoisie. So the middle classes in general uh, are going to be opposed to the proletariat. So again, in the 19th century, why wasn't there a proletarian revolution? It wasn't because the bourgeoisie was too powerful. The bourgeoisie was small and numerically outnumbered by far. But the bourgeoisie tended to form coalitions with peasants and small business or middle class people, and therefore the proletariat uh, couldn't defeat them. The last class that isn't proletariat that matters is the lumpen proletariat, the social scum, the paupers. We just looked at the images of those a moment ago. Those propertyless and largely unemployed people who largely live below uh, the, 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 the working class population. They desire social respect as much as they desire money. You know, they're really the, the kind of subaltern groups in society. And they're sort of up for political grabs. Marx tells us that this group often sides and can, can, uh, is, can, can be captured by the interest of the aristocracy, the interest of the bourgeoisie, and small business owners, and so on. They would form a kind of natural interest block with the proletariat, but often they don't. And so it's trying to comprehend why that is. So we know in America right now, uh, um, white, rural, like, like, like white people, rural people without a college degree are largely supporting Republicans and, and uh, Donald Trump in particular, despite the fact that the policies of, uh, of Republicans and Donald Trump and so on very much favor uh, uh, capitalists, business owners, right? And so the big question again right now in our time, why do poor people seem to vote against their interests and support political policies and, and politicians who work against their interests? And, and, uh, and, you know, part of it is, again, is this idea for social respect, you know, um, Trumpism, Bonapartism in, 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 um, in Marx's work is sort of about giving respect to, uh, to peasants and, and to working class people and that, and that builds political patronage.
Okay, so in Marx's world, then, Marx's politics is a class analysis. You would think it, that would be an easy story, that as capital proceeds, everything becomes either bourgeoisie or proletariat. The proletariat is going to outnumber the bourgeoisie 1,000 to 1 or 10,000 to 1. It would seem like a, like a, like a no-brainer that the proletariat would simply seize political power and the bourgeoisie is done and you move into a socialist society. Marx says it doesn't happen in practice because these other social groupings form coalitions with the bourgeoisie and fail to form coalitions with the proletariat, right? And therefore uh, keeping the proletariat politically impotent and limiting um, um, you know, progressive change. Right. So there's one story. So Marx's politics is an analysis of, of uh, social classes outside of bourgeoisie and proletariat that are conservative and reactionary and block uh, working class and proletariat political action and, uh, um, and again, keep um, uh, us moving towards a positive post-capitalist future. So there's that story. The other reactionary classes block the proletariat from seizing uh, power. The other story is that uh, the proletariat working class, the labor, cl laboring class itself, um, again, Marx thought this is the key to Marx's politics. Get working class people to recognize themselves, to develop class consciousness, revolutionary consciousness, have solidarity, effective organization, unions, parties, um, you know, uh, uh, organization for um, general mobilizations, general strikes, protests, and so on. That's the key. Well, reactionary politics, capital, is aware of this. Absolutely fully aware of this and has been for 150 years. So capital isn't going to just sort of lay back and allow the proletariat to organize and seize the political moment. Instead, reactionary politics is going to mobilize to crack and divide the proletariat, the working class, uh, and separate them into warring factions, right? Separate factions within the working class from each other thereby preventing effective organization and, and, and effective action. So, so let's take a look at this. How does this happen? So, um, okay, so, the main, so this is in you know, uh, Mark Worrell's terms, the self-defeat of the proletariat. How does the proletariat defeat itself? Again, the other story of reactionary parties who weren't the proletariat, okay, that's sort of understandable peasants have a kind of interest in keeping their, their little farm. And so they're going to organize against the, the, the proletariat who have an interest in communist seizure of farms or something, right? So there, you can kind of see that. But here is a story about working class people themselves abandoning working class solidarity and working class interests to pursue other political ends, okay? So dividing the working class against itself, all right? So, um, all right, so you turn factions of the working class against each other. How is this done? Number one, race and racialized politics. Race and racialized politics, okay? So in, in the words of, um, of um, Franz Neumann, who wrote the great book Behemoth about the rise of, of Nazism, I mean, this is basically the formula of the Nazis. You block and prevent class thinking by promoting race thinking. So anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany, um, anti-migrant, uh, to a degree anti-black, uh, anti-Native American, anti-Hispanic um, uh, thinking here, right? So the largest fissure or crack or fault line within the working class that is cracked open and um, exploited by reactionary politics uh, uh, on the part of the bourgeoisie is race. So race and racialized politics eliminate class and class politics. And we know that at our moment right now, this is a big portion of, of um, reactionary politics right now, that, the, that Trumpism is uh, deploying a racial politics that's different from anything we've seen in, in 35 or 40 years. There's a lot of political science writing about this right now that you know, during the 1980s and 1990s, there was the development of kind of symbolically coded language so you could talk about racial politics without quite talking about racial politics. And that in the last five, six years, we've seen the emergence of what's now being called old-fashioned racism, 
um, just simple, crude uh, claims about the supremacy of whites and the uh, of our na nation. I'm in Iowa. I'm in the fourth district of Iowa. Uh, Steve King, the notorious uh, ethno nationalist who was removed from all of his committees by the Republican Party in 20, um, I believe in 2018 or 2019. Uh, because of the crudity of his white uh, supremacist or white nationalist claims, um, you know this racialized politics um, is is everywhere today. And so, if you get working class people to think of themselves not as workers but as whites, not as workers but as um, as we're going to talk about in just a second, real Americans, you prevent working class solidarity. So blacks and whites and blacks and Hispanics uh, won't uh, form coalitions with each other because they're going to be targeting, again, white working class people will be targeting those who aren't white, right? So a racialized politics is a way to erase, um, uh, eviscerate, right, uh, 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 class thinking. So we don't think in terms of class. So, so instead of recognizing that we're all in this together as working people struggling against capital, um, working class white people begin to think of themselves as struggling against uh, blacks who for some reason because of affirmative action have an advantage over them and so on, right? White resentment, that kind of thing. Okay, so, so how do you divide the working class against each other? Race and racialized politics. Um, again, look at David Rediger's writings on, um, on the wages of whiteness about how long this policy has been uh, used and enforced. You know, Marx himself, just to really quick draw attention to this, I think it's page 414, yeah, in, in Capital Volume 1. Marx himself writes about, uh, about this. Okay, so the United States of America is writing about how independent workers' movement was paralyzed so long as slavery disfigured a part of the republic. So his argument was you couldn't have effective working class mobilization in the American North so long as slavery still existed in the American South. And I just love this line. Labor in a white skin cannot emancipate itself where it is branded in a black skin. Yeah. So, um, so the continuation of slavery creates conditions under which um, you know, working people cannot uh, sort of organize and mobilize, even like, like he then shifts right away to a discussion of, of limiting the length of the working day and how this movement was only made possible after the Emancipation Proclamation. He claims it was one of the great victories, the first great victories after the Civil War for the labor movement was the uh, acquisition of the eight-hour day. Um, and, and he claims it would not have been possible without um, you know, the end of slavery. Okay, so race and racialized politics, the wages of whiteness, that kind of thing, um, you know, paying people um, difference and getting people to think uh, differently in terms of race. Um, okay, um, na and then number two, nationalism and, and nativism. Nativism. So nativism refers to the belief that those who are born in a country have a different orientation to it than those who are migrants. So this is also heavily ignited right now. Nationalism, putting America first, identifying not as a worker, but as an American, right? Um, seeing oneself not as a worker, but as an American. Fantasizing that what is in the best interest of American stock market or American corporations or the American military is also in the best interest of the American worker, that kind of thing. So often, again, militarism, military identity, having served and so on, the glorification of the military, um, honoring veterans and so on. All of that is part of, of, of this link to nationalism. A few years ago, I wrote a piece with um, uh, Paul Lastly and Dick Stockner uh, on, um, on the significance of the military in Iowa, in Iowa culture. And it's astonishing how much of Iowa um, um, income, rural income, uh, rural identity, um, working class identity even is linked to, uh, to having served in the military. That is one of the main sources of social recognition and honor in small towns is having uh, a, you know, a military background. So nationalism fractures the working class, divides it in half basically, right? Again, and nativism, so working against immigrants, working against uh, globalism and so on. You know, uh, build the wall, you know, uh, um, Trump's, you know, claim we need to build the wall, build the wall and so on. It was a direct um, uh, outcome expression of that, right? 
And we know that, again, this is at, being expressed at a level we've not seen before. So instead of, again, workers in America bonding together against capital, workers who were born in America are bonding together against workers who migrate. Okay. Um, so, and then uh, uh, the third way that you divide the working class against itself is using social conservatism, especially religiously tinged reactions against, I have here, um, uh, um, gender and sexuality. So, uh, so anti-feminism, so the struggle against the Equal Rights Amendment that launched uh, the, that welded together the pro-business right and the religious right during the uh, 1970s and into the 1980s. Um, the, uh, the anti-abortion movement, which is an outgrowth of that. Um, again, religiously tinged opposition to gay marriage, to transgender rights, um, to, uh, to secularism, to science, and so on. That, 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 again, how do you crack the working class? You, you divide it along religious lines. And then, all, again, all of these reactionary positions against, um, you know, again, extending rights to, to women, to gays, um, uh, you know, reproductive rights, those kinds of things. So social conservatism, especially religious cultural conservatism, is another way that you fracture it. Finally, um, the labor aristocracy. This is something that Engels wrote about. There's been quite a bit of writing about this, where labor unions um, um, create a labor aristocracy, especially where labor unions were the kind of privileged enclave of, of whites, of European whites. Um, they kind of have a, they kind of close, they hoard opportunities for high wage, um, again, kind, kind of the blue collar aristocrats at the top of the system. Um, you know, D. Royster uh, at NYU wrote a book about a decade ago, a great book about uh, the networks uh, that black and white working class men um, follow into the workplace. And, you know, they tend to follow essentially segregated networks and that the white networks often lead into um, unionized positions and that the black networks don't. And so you get this reproduction of inequality in, uh, in labor where the unionized jobs tend to go uh, or tend to be kind of hoarded within this sort of labor aristocracy, right? And that the children of these uh, folks uh, go on. So, so again, opportunity hoarding, um, privilege protection uh, among unions. So instead of becoming agents of generalized class uh, uh, politics or class transformation or revolution, they become these narrow defensive structures protecting the high income and uh, you know, retirement benefits of their uh, retirees. All right, yeah. And then again, salaried and commissioned workers are also labor aristocrats. So you know, people who have really high incomes, you know, administrators at a university, for example, you know, people who have high incomes um, identify much more with the bourgeoisie than they do with uh, working people. So in most corporations, you know, there, uh, there used to be that there'd be a white collar and a blue collar um, pension plan that'd be different. Basket of rights would be different. Basket of, 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 of health care even would sometimes be different. So, so very different rights depending upon whether you are a salaried, educated worker versus an uneducated uh, hourly uh, um, uh, proletariat. Okay. And then, uh, again, a lot of writing on the segmented labor market so that the labor aristocracy is often white, um, again, ethnically uh, European, and, again, uh, race and gender then can actually be mapped onto this. So you divide the working class against itself along racial and gender lines by reserving positions in unions only for the children of those in unions and for fellow white union members. And by the way, all of this has been this has been one of the main ways that that we've cracked labor unions open has been over affirmative action and resentment to it and all kinds of things. So so racialized politics really finds its way in here among the labor aristocrats. So to summarize, then, how do you lead to working class self-defeat? Well, you turn factions of workers against each other based upon race, based upon uh, social conservatism, religion, reactions against gender and sexuality. Uh, generating a labor aristocracy, being anti, um, uh, promoting nationalism, militarism, uh, nativism, and so on. All right, so here we are. Number one, how does the work, what is Marx's politics? Well, number one, it's an analysis of the way that non working class people form a conservative or reactionary block that prevents uh, working class uh, politics um, 
from gaining ascendancy. Number two, it's an analysis of the way in which the working class is divided against itself, fractured and so on, so that the proletariat uses a divide and conquer strategy to keep itself in power. And then finally, um, you separate unions from labor, party politics, and revolutionary activity. This means that, that labor unions in the late 20th century, um, you know, in part because of the, the you know, McCarthy era, anti-communist movement, anti-Marxist movement, red baiting, you know, the current hatred of so-called class warfare, unions have ceased to be politically potent forces. They're just simply agents of collective bargaining, right? So unions then are, are narrowed, they're restrained to contract negotiations, and they abandon party politics and revolutionary struggle. All right. All right. And then, yeah, and then capital actually has been fleeing parts of the world that have, uh, uh, you know, dense unionization so that, uh, yeah. Okay. And then finally, the last point is that there's a reconstruction of labor and socialist parties under neoliberalism. So since 19, say, 75 or so, 1980, we've lost the connection of labor unions and revolutionary consciousness that used to inform, say, democratic uh, politics uh, or the Democratic Party in America, labor in, in Britain and elsewhere. And we have now like new Democrats who no longer get the majority of their funding from unions, but get it instead from uh, corporations. Third way, liberalism in Britain, the same thing, Tony Blair, you know, you basically have uh, no longer one party that represents labor and one that represents capital. We've that labor lost out. And so, you now have two parties that are more or less pro-capitalist and representing the interests of capital. OK, so the third way in which um, uh, Mar the third major area of Marxist politics then is the complete vanquishing of revolutionary con uh, consciousness from unions and parties. So during our time, we've seen a loss. Um, so class issues have been backgrounded. When social protests occur, because we don't have a vibrant labor movement, because we don't have vibrant revolutionary uh, parties, when something like Black Lives Matter movements ignite around the country this last summer, um, there was a little bit of tying in with uh, working class uh, co uh, 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 grievances and so on, but, but not much. And that's largely due to, again, a kind of a lack of a coordinating structure of uh, uh, unions and so on that could have um, promoted a kind of general mobilization. Um, so again, there's no revolutionary consciousness among the working class, right? In fact, they're some of the most conservative people in the country. Uh, number two, there's the Society of Spectacle. This is Guy Debord's uh, book. Uh, my book I wrote with um, uh, Bill Swart, The New Economy of Spectacle, that we're living in a time when uh, working class people are plugged in 24 hours a day, seven, hour, uh, seven days a week, to pacifying media and or even reactionary media. So that means that you're paying attention to social media, to television, to sports, and so on, none of which is linked to your consciousness as worker. So I think, you know, I, I listen often to AM 1040 here in Iowa, which is the, uh, um, um, I, I don't know, they're a Fox News affiliate. And um, uh, they, they, they promote, um, you know, Rush Limbaugh and other right wing uh, uh, programming. And so working class people, construction workers, truck drivers, farmers throughout Iowa, listen in to anti working class uh, propaganda on a daily basis. And so you're not just listening to pacifying media, media that pacifies the worker and gets their mind off of working class issues, but they're actually listening to reactionary media that's, that's, that's working against their interests and getting them, again, to look down on uh, the poor or looking down on migrants or looking down at, at, at other working class people who are organized uh, in, the, in the labor movement or unions and so on, and valorizing the wealthy and valorizing uh, um, you know, small business owners and so on. So again, new social media technologies then keep workers' consciousness uh, captured by, uh, by anything uh, except labor, <laughs> uh, labor solidarity. So like, like any programming except labor programming, right? And so, so uh, uh, and anything except to focus on the economic interests of the worker. So party identification, uh, yeah, so party identity, new tribalism, so all of this programming that's emphasizing a Republican identity and viewing oneself as a member of a tribe, a team that you defend. Uh, so you're not thinking about working class politics, you're just in a knee jerk way defending your tribe of Republicans or something, right? 
sports fandoms being part of that uh reactionary lifestyle enclaves um and tribal consumption yeah so uh so in, in the book i wrote with uh, Bill Swart on NASCAR and uh, large displacement motorcycle rallies. These are reactionary spaces, right-wing spaces, spaces that are openly hostile to um, uh, to left uh, politics and, and uh, working class identity uh, and are really focused instead upon um, a kind of uh, oppositional identity uh, against liberalism, against, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite honestly, Democrats, uh, you know, and, and, and then there's lots of tribal consumption that goes on. So I've got a chapter in our book um, on, on dark spectacle. It's an analysis of, of um, again, of the presence of right-wing propaganda inside of these uh, lifestyle enclaves. So this is where workers are spending their time. They're not spending it in labor union halls or in um, um, revolutionary meetings or in um, contract negotiation uh, sessions. They're spending their time in football uh, NASCAR and, um, um, you know, Rush Limbaugh. So, okay. And then finally, um, Trumpism, like Bonapartism, which we're going to analyze in the next video, is all about strategies, uh, excuse me, uses all of those above strategies to crack and fracture working class power. So the bourgeoisie came into immense power, accumulated very rapidly in, in the 19th century, partly because some of the power was soft and didn't have to be hard. Today, it's very hard power, um, but there's been an immense explosion of, of, of uh, pro-capitalist legislation, pro-capitalist executive orders, uh, while working people are actively cheering um, these attacks on other working people. So our time, the time of Trump is a time in which, um, you know, workers are not bonding together against capital, but are instead uh, against the squared off against each other. Capital has organized them, so they're squared off against each other, um, essentially uh, preventing each other from, uh, from gaining any political ascendancy. I think with that, I'm going to stop and we'll move on to the next video.